All right, it's 10 o'clock, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healing Community Study Learning Collaborative. My name is Lisa Romley, and I'm the Learning Collaborative Coordinator for the HEAL Study. We're here today to discuss the legal and liability issues surrounding the use of naloxone, as well as the laws and the statutes for the state of Kentucky. I just need to review a few housekeeping items before we get started. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded today. And if your screen name is not your full name, you're using a partial name or your iPhone, if you could please update that now and change it to your full name, this just helps when we compare the participants' names in this session to our registration list. We are offering CE credits for today's session. One CE credit has been approved for physicians, pharmacists, nurses, social workers, and alcohol and drug counselors. And I'll give you instructions on how to obtain that CE credit at the end of uh, the session. We do ask that you stay on mute throughout the session. That just reduces the echo and extraneous noises. And if you have questions for today's session, please use the raise hand feature, which is you can click on the reaction button at the bottom of your screen and then click on the raised hand, or just go ahead and type your question in the chat box and we'll read it sometime during the session. I will now turn it over to Dr. Carrie Oser, who is the faculty lead on the criminal legal team for the HEAL Community Study, who will introduce our speaker and panelists for today. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Carrie Oser. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to introduce our panelists. Um, first off, we have Monica Roberts, and she's going to be presenting um, for about a 30 minute or so presentation, and then we will have an exciting roundtable discussion. So I really encourage people to put their questions in the chat or raise their hand, and I will try to um, integrate everybody into the conversation. I wanted to first introduce Monica Roberts, who is an academic detailing pharmacist with the Healing Community Study. Prior to uh, joining the UK HCS team, she practiced in community pharmacy and completed a residency training with UK and Kroger Pharmacy. She's certified to initiate the dispensing of naloxone per protocol. And in addition to her PharmD from UK, she holds a BA in newspaper journalism and psychology from Syracuse University. I wanna briefly welcome our three panelists, Ben Goldman from the Center for Health Equity within the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness, Kathy Solomon, who um, is the Medication for Addiction Treatment Program Coordinator at Louisville Metro De Department of Corrections, and Chris Nordlow, who is the Assistant Kenton County Attorney. And I'll share a, a more um, proper bio when we get to the roundtable discussion. So Monica, we'll let you share your screen now and get started. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'm going to share my screen. As Carrie said, my name is Monica Roberts, and I am a pharmacist with the Healing Community Study. Um, my background is in community pharmacy and journalism, so I am not a law enforcement officer or a lawyer. Um, which means I'm going to try to focus on kind of the basics of naloxone um, and let the other folks on the call sort of answer the more legal related questions. Um, I'll also note that I have given versions of this talk probably about a dozen times over the last couple of years. So if you have heard me speak before and you feel like you're having deja vu, I apologize. I do update the slides every time I give it. So uh, hopefully there will be a nugget or two that's new. Um, each time you hear it. I do not have any relevant financial relationships to disclose. My position is supported by NIH through the HEAL initiative, um, but I do not speak for any branch of the federal government. My content is solely mine. There are some practice gaps and educational needs listed here, as well as some learning objectives, but really my goal today is just to establish baseline knowledge so that we can have a really rich and informed discussion about overdose education and naloxone distribution. Where I always start is by talking a little bit about the history of naloxone use and um, the names that we use for naloxone. So the name that you guys are probably most familiar with is Narcan. And the reason you know Narcan is because that was the brand name of the first naloxone product approved by the FDA. 
So Narcan solution for injection was initially approved in 1971. Um, it came in vials or ampules like you see here. And it was almost entirely used in hospitals and emergency departments um, to reverse the effects of opioids, usually opioids used therapeutically. So um, the hospital was using opioids for pain management or sedation, and they wanted the naloxone to have as kind of a safety measure. Over the years, Narcan eventually went generic. It got um, incredibly cheap. Uh, and there, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there started to be kind of this grassroots movement among communities of people who use drugs to access naloxone and distribute it among themselves so that they could rescue each other when an overdose occurred. So this started out as kind of an illegal and underground uh, distribution network um, of this injectable naloxone, generic naloxone vials. Um, as this started to gain steam and uh, more and more people started to use it, we started to get research done that showed um, naloxone use by bystanders was safe, it was effective, and it was really helping to save people's lives. So the FDA and the drug manufacturer said, well, if people are doing this and we know it's safe, we should have products that are designed for bystanders to use versus using the ones that were designed for, for healthcare professionals. So the first bystander use product that was approved was called Evzio. This was a really fancy auto injector device. It even gave audio directions when you pulled the cap off. Um, and it was approved in 2014. Hot on its heels was Narcan nasal spray. So it was a simpler um, one-time use nasal spray device uh, that was less expensive than Evzio, although by no means cheap. And Narcan nasal spray quickly dominated the market for bystander use. And I would say it is probably still the most commonly distributed and used um, bystander naloxone product. It has also since gone generic. So there are now generic naloxone nasal sprays. That's helped push the price down a little bit, although it's still um, more expensive than we would like it to be. In 2020, Evzio realized they were never going to be able to make money on this product, and so they pulled it from the market. Um, it is still approved, it's still safe to use, but they don't manufacture it anymore. In 2021, we got our first naloxone, new naloxone product in a while. This is Cloxado. It looks almost exactly like Narcan nasal spray. It's almost the exact same device. Um, the difference here is that it is eight milligrams per dose instead of four milligrams per dose. So we consider this a high dose naloxone product. In 2022, we got Zimhi. This is also considered a high dose naloxone product. Um, and this brings back a bystander injection device. Um, this is a little bit simpler, more just like a pre-filled syringe than an auto injector. The important thing here is that all of these products, regardless of how we administer them or what we call them, are naloxone. So they're all going to work the same way when they get into the body. To confuse you just a little bit, um, we do have another product that reverses opioid um, overdoses. It's called Nelmaphene. It was off the market for a long time. Baxter discontinued it in 2008, um, but Purdue Pharma brought it back last year. They say they're distributing it for no profit, um, and the current version of it is just available for use in hospitals and emergency departments. That said, there is a nasal spray version um, under review by the FDA right now, so it is possible in the next year or so that you'll see nalmaphene available for bystander use. I just wanted to let you know that it was another thing, and it's out there in case you hear of it. Um, I won't talk a ton about the, the differences or the pharmacology. Um, because I think naloxone is going to stay kind of the predominant opioid reversal drug. So let's talk a little about how naloxone works. And to understand how naloxone works, we need to understand how opioids work. So just a reminder that um, opioid drugs are, are prescription pain medications and are illicit opioids, heroin, fentanyl, and the fentanyl analogs. Opioids all work basically the same way they connect to and turn on the opioid receptors in our brain and body. And when those opioid receptors are turned on, we get kind of a cascade of expected effects. So we get what we're going for, which is pain relief. And then we might potentially get some euphoria. We almost always get slowed breathing. 
we get sedation that causes sleepiness, dizziness, confusion, and then side effects like constipation, itching, urinary retention. When too many opioid receptors are turned on, um, the expected effects of opioids progress to the point where they become life-threatening. So an opioid overdose um, has two main features. One is um, intense sedation. So this is sedation to the point where even um, intense stimuli, painful stimuli is not enough to rouse the person. And then the life-threatening part of this is respiratory depression. So the person is breathing slowly, shallow breaths. Um, it might look like they've stopped breathing entirely, and that's going to result in not enough oxygen getting to the body, and you're going to see signs of low oxygen. So blue or gray lips and fingernails. Uh, eventually, the blood pressure starts to drop. The heart rate slows down. The person goes into a coma, and if this isn't reversed, um, death will follow. The good news is we have naloxone, and I think this is a cool slide. Um, naloxone looks a lot like an opioid, um, but it is just a little bit different, and that little difference makes a huge change in how it works. It is what we call a pure opioid antagonist, so naloxone can fit into that receptor. Um, in fact, it fits in better than some opioids, and it fits, but it doesn't turn the receptor on. So all it does is sit there and block the opioid receptor from turning on. If there are opioids in the receptor, it can outcompete for that receptor. So it knocks the opioid off, sits down on the receptor and turns the receptor off. What this means is that it is incredibly safe if opioids are not present. So I have not taken any opioids today. My opioid receptors are mostly turned off. If you gave me naloxone, Naloxone would sit in my receptors. Those receptors would stay off. You wouldn't see any effects. Naloxone can't do anything else other than sit in those opioid receptors. The flip side of this is that for somebody who is used to having those opioid receptors turned on, their body has compensated for those opioid receptors being on. When you suddenly turn a whole bunch of them off, the person experiences withdrawal symptoms. So this looks like the opposite of the opioid symptoms you get a rapid heart rate, you get an amplified pain response, you get um, anxiety or agitation, you get diarrhea and sweating. Um, this is an uncomfortable state, uh, but we generally say it is not a life-threatening state unless it is incredibly severe. So the key steps in overdose response are call 911 or get emergency medical help on its way. Administer naloxone every two to three minutes until the person is breathing effectively. There's two really important points in that sentence. The first is the two to three minutes. Naloxone works really fast, but it still takes a few minutes to work. So um, you've in an emergency, this is going to feel like a while, but you've got to give it a chance before you administer the next dose. The other key point is you're looking for the person to breathe effectively. We used to say the person's going to wake up, they're going to breathe. Uh, but lately we have seen a growing trend of mixed overdoses where the person has taken opioids and potentially another sedative or tranquilizer. And so the naloxone will revert, reverse the respiratory depression of the opioids, but it might not reverse the sedation. Um, so you're looking for the person to be breathing, not necessarily for the person to be awake and alert. Do not leave the person alone after giving naloxone. I mentioned the withdrawal symptoms. There is also the problem that naloxone can wear off before the opioids wear off. So naloxone is blocking the effects of the opioids. If naloxone wears off and the opioids are still there, the person can slip back into an overdose. So it is important to stay with that person until they've been kind of passed off to um, medical help. If you know how to do rescue breathing and you're comfortable doing rescue breathing, Continue that until somebody comes and takes over. Uh, if you don't know how to do rescue breathing, still give the naloxone. Um, that is the most important part in an overdose. If you have to leave for any reason, or if the person is breathing but not awake, put the person in the recovery position. So this is on their side with their knee bent to keep them from rolling over and their hand supporting their head. Uh, this is to keep them safe. If they vomit, you don't want them to aspirate. If they wake up and they're disoriented, you don't want them to fall or hurt themselves um, in some other way. 
If you have nasal naloxone, it is incredibly easy to use. You just open the package, place the nozzle in the nostril, press the plunger. The important thing here is don't press the plunger until it's in the nose. It's a one-time use device. So if you test it or prime it or play with it, you might lose the dose before it gets in the person's nose. If you have Zimhi, the naloxone injection, um, this is also very simple. You take the cap off, you press the um, device into the person's thigh. This can go through clothes if it needs to. Push the plunger, hold it for about three seconds, and then remove the needle and cover the needle with the safety device. I've alluded to this a couple times, but naloxone is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Um, somebody who is revived with naloxone still needs follow-up care to make sure that they are okay. I always say naloxone is the start of the rescue. It is not the entire rescue. So now we're going to shift and focus on some facts and try to dispel some misconceptions that we hear out in the world about naloxone. The first, <clears throat> excuse me, the first fact is naloxone does not encourage drug use. So we have stu studies that show there is no associated increase in opioid use in people who receive take-home naloxone. Um, people don't get a dose of naloxone and say, oh good, I have this, now I can go use more or use more often. Um, that's just not how it works. In fact, we have some studies that suggest that overdose education and naloxone distribution programs result in decreased drug use and increases in treatment. So every touch point that we can have with somebody who has a substance use disorder is a chance to help them um, make healthier choices, seek treatment, get connected to the resources that they need. If you don't believe the studies or you don't believe me, um, I think it is telling that all major medical associations have issued calls for more naloxone distribution. So the World Health Organization, federal agencies, the American Medical Association, all of these organizations have said we need more naloxone in our communities. Uh, I think it is safe to say that if there was any indication that naloxone was adding to the addiction problems or increasing the odds of overdose, uh, that these organizations would not be out there um, proclaiming that we needed more naloxone. The next fact is that naloxone products are not controlled substances. Uh, a quick reminder of kind of how we regulate drugs in our country. Um, naloxone falls in this legend drug category. So this is the same category as um, blood pressure medicine and antibiotics and insulin, kind of your everyday prescription drugs. It is not um, considered having potential for misuse or abuse, um, and it is not available over the counter. I did break it out over here from other prescription drugs because despite it being a legend drug federally, every state in the country has come up with some way to make it easier to get naloxone than a typical prescription drug. Here in Kentucky, we have our naloxone statute, KRS 217186. And a section of this statute states that certified pharmacists can dispense naloxone under a physician approved protocol. So this is Kentucky's way of making it easier to access naloxone. Um, what this means is that if a pharmacist chooses to, they can work with a physician to have kind of a standing order prescription um, where any patient that walks into the pharmacy, the pharmacist can issue a prescription as if the physician had written it. Um, so the goal here is to make it possible that um, you don't have to see the doctor and the pharmacist to get the prescription medication. Um, this is optional in Kentucky. Some states have kind of statewide standing orders. Kentucky does not. Uh, so some pharmacies don't participate, but I would say the vast majority of pharmacies in Kentucky do have a physician approved protocol. We also have a growing trend toward what I call immediate access naloxone. So this takes two forms. The first is on site response units. They look like this it's basically a box that you stick on a wall with your AED or your first aid kit. Um, you put it in a public place where if an overdose happens, any, anybody who knows that it's there can run and get the naloxone and administer that naloxone during the overdose. 
We also are now seeing naloxone vending machines. Um, this is a little different. It looks just like a vending machine for drinks or food, um, but it distributes naloxone for people to have and take home and carry. So not necessarily that emergency response, but just a way for people to get naloxone um, without having to kind of have that face-to-face -face interaction and potentially encounter um, stigma or any other uncomfortable kind of conversations that people are worried about having. Um, both of these are legal in Kentucky if they are set up correctly. So we're starting to see more of this pick up. We're seeing vending machines, um, particularly in health departments and jails. Uh, and then the on-site response units are kind of showing up all over the place. Even here at UK, we've got them in a lot of our um, built public buildings now. So you might be thinking, okay, it's a federally um, legend drug, prescription drug, but we've got it all over the place. <laughs> Why can't we just walk into Walgreens and pick it up off the shelf like we do our aspirin or our Tylenol? Why isn't naloxone OTC yet? And the FDA has been encouraging over-the-counter naloxone for many, many years. Um, they, it, the law requires that a manufacturer make an over-the-counter product and submit it to the FDA. And the FDA has been telling the manufacturers that they need to do this. Um, they had not taken the bait for a long time. And then finally, the FDA kind of issued one last uh, warning in November of last year. They called it a preliminary assessment of safety. And um, that was enough to get two, or two companies to submit applications for over-the-counter naloxone. So Emergent, the company that makes Narcan nasal spray, and Harm Reduction Therapeutics has a new product called Revive um, that are both under review right now by the FDA. The FDA Advisory Committee voted last week unanimously that these products should be approved. Um, so we expect that the FDA will take that advice and um, we're thinking that by the end of March, Narcan nasal spray will be approved uh, for over-the-counter sales. So hopefully the next time I give this talk, I won't have to do this full spiel about <laughs> the legality of naloxone. The next fact is sort of tangentially related to naloxone, but I think it's important to talk about. Um, it is that fentanyl is not magic. So we are seeing uh, lots of stories in the news media and social media about people being exposed to fentanyl. And these take two kind of themes. The first one is somebody going about their daily life and touching an object, often it's money, and experiencing what they believe to be is an opioid overdose as a result of fentanyl on that object. The other theme we see is our law enforcement officers um, searching a person or a car or something else and um, being exposed to something that they believe to be fentanyl and experiencing what they believe to be is an opioid overdose from that exposure. In the top story, um, you probably saw this. This is a woman from Lexington. She was traveling through Tennessee. She picked up a dollar bill at McDonald's um, and then wound up in the hospital. The bottom story is from Michigan. Two sheriff's deputies were searching a woman's backpack and they said an aerosol powder came up in the air. They felt nauseous and dizzy. One of them had a heart rate of 220 beats per minute. And so they self-administered naloxone and went to the hospital. Um, both of these stories and the stories like them, I have not examined these people, but I feel very confident in saying that neither of them are opioid overdoses and neither of them are fentanyl exposures. The reason I feel confident in saying this is because the risk of accidental fentanyl exposure is incredibly low so low that I don't worry about it. Um, skin is a, an incredible barrier. We have fentanyl patches that are designed and engineered specifically to get fentanyl into the bloodstream through the skin. Um, and even those take hours of contact before they provide pain relief, much less um, an overdose. So the notion that there could be enough fentanyl or that the fentanyl could be in a form on an object that somebody could accidentally touch this and experience an overdose is just, it's not pharmacologically plausible. Similarly, accidentally inhaling something um, in a quantity sufficient to cause an overdose is, is just not plausible. The other way that I know that these are not opioid overdoses is opioid overdoses have predictable symptoms. I talked about them at the beginning. 
sedation, respiratory depression, slowed blood pressure, slowed heart rate. Um, these symptoms that we see in these cases often don't match. So somebody who is alert enough to self-administer naloxone is not having an opioid overdose. Um, somebody with a heart rate of 220 beats per minute is not experiencing symptoms of an overdose um, or of an opioid overdose. Um, administering naloxone in these cases uh, is not necessary. It's not going to do much. Um, but the good news is it is safe. So we're not seeing from all these stories that people are having untoward effects of naloxone. So the bright side is we have lots of anecdotes now that naloxone is safe. So I say all this not to make light of the fentanyl situation. Um, it is not to make fun of the people that believe they're experiencing opioid overdoses. It is because I think there is a lot of anxiety in the world about fentanyl right now. And I think we need to point that anxiety in the right direction. Um, we need to kind of lower the temperature in the general public and focus our anxiety on people who really are at risk from fentanyl. So let's look at a few more headlines and see who is at risk from fentanyl. Overdose deaths surged during the pandemic as more drugs were laced with fentanyl. We had 2,250 drug overdose deaths in Kentucky in 2021. An opioid was involved in 90% of drug overdose deaths in Kentucky, and fentanyl was involved in 73% of drug overdose deaths. So there is a risk from fentanyl for people who use drugs. Fentanyl tainted pills bought on social media cause youth drug deaths to soar. We're seeing a growing trend of counterfeit prescription medications, pills that contain fentanyl that are made to look like Xanax or Oxycodone or Ambien um, that people are buying or sharing among themselves. It often occurs among high schoolers and college students. Um, and these are people that maybe naively don't have any idea that um, what they buy is not what it purports to be. So this is, a, this is a group that is at risk from fentanyl and that needs to be educated on this. The cocaine was laced with fentanyl, now six are dead from overdoses. This is another trend we're seeing in our illicit drug market, um, cocaine and methamphetamine that is contaminated with fentanyl. Um, there's a lot of debate about how and why this is happening, uh, but the important thing is that for somebody who does not ordinarily use opioids, ingesting any amount of fentanyl can be very dangerous. So people who are buying cocaine, who maybe only ever use cocaine, um, are at high risk from fentanyl if their drugs are contaminated. And then lastly, this could be its own hour long lecture on how and why this is happening. Um, but the US death toll from drug overdoses is rising fast among non-white populations. The demographics of the overdose epidemic are shifting. Uh, so it is just a reminder that we need to reach a broad audience with education and naloxone distribution. Again, naloxone is our good news. Uh, naloxone will reverse a fentanyl overdose when given in time. We, a lot of times we'll hear people say, oh, uh, you know, fentanyl is too potent. Naloxone doesn't work when it's a fentanyl overdose. Uh, that is not true. What is true is that fentanyl overdoses progress quickly, more quickly typically than heroin overdoses or other opioid overdoses. So it is incredibly important that when somebody is showing the signs of an overdose and has reached that sedated, respiratory depressed um, point that they are given naloxone quickly um, to reverse that overdose before the person dies. The next fact is naloxone does not make people angry or violent. Um, we talked earlier about how naloxone works and what it does. There's no way that it can evoke violent behavior on its own. Where this comes from is withdrawal symptoms, right? So withdrawal symptoms can be uncomfortable. They can be disorienting. It is understandable that somebody um, may be angry um, following recovery from an opioid overdose because of the way they feel. The important thing here is that we have one study that looked at what circumstances make anger more likely following naloxone administration? And the number one circumstance that was most strongly associated with anger was the responders positive or negative communication style. So if you are worried about how somebody is going to react, 
the one thing you can control, which is how you react, is the one thing that is going to help the situation most. So if you stay calm and positive, hey, you had an overdose, we gave you naloxone, you're gonna be okay, help is on the way, and so on, um, that is gonna reduce the likelihood that the person is going to be angry compared to if you are yelling at the person or berating them when they um, come back. And then lastly, there are legal protections related to naloxone. I said earlier, I am not a lawyer. However, the naloxone statute, KRS 217186, I believe is simple enough that even a pharmacist can understand it. I encourage you, if you have any questions about this or curiosity about this, um, to go read the statute yourself. It's about a page and a half long. It is very straightforward. Uh, I do not think the legislature could be clearer that they um, support naloxone use in our communities. A couple snippets from this statute, a person or agency, including a peace officer, jailer, firefighter, paramedic, and so on, can receive a prescription for naloxone, possess naloxone, administer naloxone, and even provide naloxone as part of a harm reduction program to people who have been trained. So they are saying, you can have it, you can use it, you can even hand it out if you are training people on its administration. It goes on to say, a person acting in good faith who provides or administers naloxone shall be immune from criminal and civil liability for the administration um, unless there's gross negligence or willful or wanton misconduct. So if you are um, out trying to do the right thing, trying to save a person's life, you are immune from criminal and civil liability. There is also a Good Samaritan law in Kentucky. This statute is KRS 218A133, um, and it protects someone seeking assistance with a drug overdose from prosecution for possession of controlled substances or drug paraphernalia. And this is um, important to understand here. There are details and uh, kind of nuances to this law. The person has to act in good faith remain with the individual who needs assistance, and the evidence for the charge has to be obtained as a result of the overdose and the need for assistance. So this is not a get out of jail free card. This only covers people from prosecution for possession, um, and it only covers people when they, the evidence for the charge is obtained as a result of somebody calling 911 um, because an overdose is occurring. So I will not try to get into all of the details here. Again, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to read the statute yourself and then um, talk to uh, experts in this area about the Good Samaritan Law. But it is important to know that we have a Good Samaritan Law. Um, again, the, the legislature in Kentucky seems to be encouraging us to um, do what we can to save lives in the situation of a drug overdose. So I see there are some things in the chat. This is all that I have for my presentation. So I will try to answer any questions or turn it back over to Carrie. So thank you so much, Monica. I think dispelling some of these myths is so important. And we do have a few great questions in the chat, one of which is asking about uh, fentanyl overdoses and do they work the same way in children? If you could speak a bit upon that. Yeah, so obviously um, with children, less exposure, you know, less drug is going to cause more of a problem um, just because of body weight and developmental issues. Um, but I think it is safe to say that um, accidental exposure in terms of skin contact or inhalation is still highly unlikely in kids. Um, the bigger risk with children is they get into something that contains fentanyl and they ingest it or um, they accidentally take something, um, then they are at high risk for um, adverse effects from the fentanyl. Um, so again, I think the anxiety around um, accidental exposure is too high. I don't think we need to worry all that much about it. I think we need to worry about people who are taking drugs or taking something that they don't know contains fentanyl. So we have another good question here about what are the symptoms to people who have a darker skin tone? Yeah, so um, still kind of not necessarily blue, but kind of that gray, um, pale, not, um, not getting enough oxygen 
look to the person, right? Everybody's going to look a little bit different. Um, but you're looking for signs that the person is, is not, um, getting enough oxygen in their system. And, so it's, and as Jody day. says in the chat, looking for unresponsiveness. So if you find somebody who is down and you cannot wake them up, give naloxone. Um, I would not worry about the details of, you know, how hypoxic are they or what exactly did they take? Um, if you can't, re if you can't revive them, um, by shaking or giving a sternal rub, give the naloxone. I think another one of the misconceptions is about people being violent when they're administered naloxone. And so, uh, you know, another thing that Jody Jaggers brought up is that it could be related to a brain injury and that could um, relate to disoriented or more aggressive behavior. Can you speak a little bit on that? Yeah, um, Jody is right there. The Obviously, the longer somebody is without oxygen, the more likely that they could experience brain injury and um, that can contribute to a whole whole other uh, set of symptoms that may occur. But again, um, you know, they looked at hundreds of overdoses and they found that the rescuer remaining calm and remaining positive is the best way to sort of quell whatever is going on with the person when they are um, revived with naloxone. And there's also a question, um, Monica, about how frequently to give naloxone. And um, this participant asked if there's any harm that could be caused by giving naloxone too frequently. What's the yeah. So I encourage you to wait that two to three minutes. If you've got the 911 operator on the line, um, they can help you figure out when to give the next dose of naloxone. There is no maximum dose of naloxone. You can keep giving it until the person is breathing. Um, that said, the more naloxone we give, the more withdrawal symptoms we're going to expect. So um, there is a lot of debate about, you know, if you hit somebody with eight milligrams all at once, um, if that is going to throw them into a very severe withdrawal, that's not a good thing to do to somebody. It's not a good situation um, for you or the person. So there's kind of a balance there, right? Uh, between you want to make sure they get enough that they are revived, but you don't want to give so much that they are in severe opioid withdrawal. Um, as a result of the naloxone. So how, how much is enough? Is it just <laughs> responsive or? There is, yeah, there is no right answer to that question. So um, it depends on the person. It depends on the dose. It depends on how much um, opioid tolerance and uh, physical dependence that they have. So generally that's why we say give a dose, wait two to three minutes. If they are breathing well enough to um, maintain oxygen, then you can stop. If they are not breathing well enough or you have any doubts, go ahead and give another dose after that two to three minutes and keep going as long as you have naloxone um, at, or EMS shows up um, every two to three minutes. Okay, thank you. And then there was also a question about carfentanil and if you could share how naloxone works. Yeah, so naloxone will work with all of the fentanyl analogs, carfentanil, um, any of the other ones. We probably don't even know about all of the fentanyl analogs that are out there. Um, some of those are incredibly potent. So again, you're looking at a time issue, a progress, fast progress of the overdose versus um, other opioids. But in terms of effectiveness, um, the naloxone will work and will displace the carfentanil. Um, again, it might take a little bit more or um, need to be given a little bit faster, but naloxone will work for carfentanil. Thank you. And we have a few questions about um, the nalox boxes and vending machines in terms of temperature controlled environments. What, what is needed there for? Yeah, so for the nalox boxes and the vending machines, we want them in a um, controlled room temperature environment, uh, generally that's going to keep the naloxone um, at, a, at a stable, potent level. Um, in terms of personal use naloxone, we've seen lots of um, studies that show it can, it can survive high and low temperatures. The big thing is we don't want it to be frozen when we need it, and we don't want it to sit around at super high temperatures for a really long time. So trying not to keep it in your car if possible right. <laughs> during the hot summer months is good advice. There is a question about vending machines and kind of um, some 
some concerns about some stigma within the community. And so I think we'll address those as part of our round table. And then there is also a question about if a larger dose of naloxone would reduce the risk of regressing back like into a delayed respiratory failure. Yeah, so a larger a larger dose will not necessarily um, prevent that. It Naloxone works for about 90 minutes. Um, so it's more of a time issue than it is a dose issue. In fact, I would probably say um, if you have six doses of naloxone and the person is breathing again after three, save the other three doses for an hour and a half from now to make sure that they're not slipping back into the, um, the overdose. That is probably the better strategy versus giving it all up front and then having it all wear off at the same time. Um, the, the nalmethine that I mentioned earlier is kind of the longer duration naloxone, um, but it comes with its own set of kind of concerns. So that is part of the reason why nalmethine is, is being pushed again. And nalmethine is that injectable formulation that's just that's used in hospitals. In hospitals for now, yes. Emergency departments. Okay. Yep. Um, so we also have a question about side effects. What are the side effects of naloxone? And especially like if in kids, if they're administered naloxone, are there any long-term side effects? Have studies been done to investigate the long-term impact? I don't know of any studies to investigate the long-term impact. Um, from a pharmacology standpoint, I think the long-term impacts that you would be worried about are more related to the um, hypoxia, the lack of oxygen during the overdose versus the naloxone drug itself. Um, so I would think it would be more of a long-term effect of the overdose. Um, like I said, naloxone wears off fairly quickly. Uh, it doesn't do anything other than sit on those receptors and block it. So I would not anticipate naloxone to have any long-term effects, but I would be worried about uh, particularly a child who has experienced um, a period of hypoxia and has experienced kind of the trauma of overdose uh, in terms of long-term issues. Thank you so much, Monica Roberts. We appreciate your time and we hope that you will stick with us to be a panelist on our round table. So I think we'll transition to that. And I'd like to introduce our other round um, table panelist, the first of which is Ben Goldman. So Ben, if you could give a little wave. Um, ben joined the Center for Health Equity in 2019 within the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness. He currently leads the behavioral health equity team. Uh, he and his team work to eliminate inequities associated with substance use and mental health by addressing the root causes. And this is really important work. Um, under his leadership, the team has launched an overdose quick response team, um, convened partners to create community-wide suicide prevention plans, and help Louisville become the first city in the South to provide Narcan to people inside of its jail dorms. And so we will ask some questions about those Nalox boxes that are available within the Louisville um, Metro Department of Corrections. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Kathy Solomon, who is the Medication for Addiction Treatment Program Coordinator at Louisville Metro Department of Corrections in Louisville. And so in partnership with the Louisville Metro Public Health and Wellness, Kathy has spearheaded the development and execution of the jail's innovative medication for addiction treatment or medication for opioid use disorder treatment programs, and also their overdose education and naloxone distribution programs. She's developed a successful proposal for jail leadership to partner with the Healing Community Study implementation of a harm reduction vending machine that we're working on implemented in, inside of Louisville Metro Department of Corrections. So we're glad that Kathy is here with us today. I'd also like to introduce Chris Norloff, who is the Assistant Kenton County Attorney. Um, he has dedicated over 25 years as a practicing attorney to representing individuals and government officials within the federal and state courts with a focus on litigation, trial, and appellate practices lead counsel. So thank you all for being here today. And um, if our audience has questions, please put them in the chat or that's better, I think, than raising hands because it's hard to see everybody on the screen. So the, the chat does just roll up. 
But I think my first question is for Chris, and if you could define medical amnesty and explain how it relates to naloxone. Sure. Good morning, everybody. And this is actually a, a good segue from, from Monica's presentation. She had mentioned the medical amnesty statute, which is KRS 218A.133, enacted by the Kentucky legislature in 2015. And I'm going to unpack just a little bit of uh, some of the cases that have been decided um, since the passage of that legislation. Um, essentially, what the legislation says is that if 911 is called or medical help is sought uh, for what reasonably appears to be a drug overdose, then amnesty applies for possession charges to whomever is present at the location of the overdose. Now, uh, there's been some challenges in the courts as to whether or not uh, the person uh, who calls uh, 911 or seeks the help uh, needs to remain present at the scene for the amnesty to apply. And the answer to that question is no. Ideally, you would like them to remain, but the, the, the courts have held that whoever is seeking the amnesty, uh, so long as they are present at the scene, um, then they will have the protections. Now, sometimes folks will call 911 for suspicious circumstances, folks sitting in cars um, uh, uh, in, in residential neighborhoods, uh, and they'll call 911 for an investigation of, of that purpose. And that has uh, since happened and in 2021, the Kentucky Supreme Court said that the amnesty will not apply if the 911 caller according to reasonable person standards, does not believe that they are asking for intervention for a drug overdose. And drug overdose is defined, and I'm gonna read it verbatim because it's important. It's an acute condition of physical illness, coma, mania, hysteria, seizure, cardiac arrest, cessation of breathing or death, which reasonably appears to be the result of consumption or use of a controlled substance, or another substance with which a controlled substance was combined and that a layperson would reasonably believe requires medical assistance. So if someone calls 911 uh, as they drive by in a, uh, for instance, a Home Depot parking lot and sees an individual uh, sleeping in their car, calls 911 and doesn't provide sufficient objective uh, evidence that they have a concern of an overdose. When the first responders show up, um, there may be a challenge in the courts as to whether or not that amnesty will actually apply. And the burden uh, to show that amnesty applies is on the person seeking it uh, in the courts. Um, so those are some of the, the cases that have been uh, decided uh, since this legislation was passed. And some other issues that have arisen is if first responders show up, police show up, and there's evidence of other criminal activity other than just the possession of uh, uh, the, the opioids or uh, paraphernalia, uh, the amnesty statute doesn't stretch uh, to protect them from charges relating to those other crimes. Um, since the legislation in 2015, I, I mean, there's like just been a smattering of cases, two or three that have, have that have discussed these issues. I, I think I think the intent of the General Assembly is clear. They're signaling uh, they they want they want the Good Samaritans to um, to stop. They want them to make the call. They want them to get uh, help for those who they reasonably perceive are suffering from an overdose and. Uh, also, as Monica mentioned, you know, you, you have the Good Samaritan uh, statute, which is a little bit different from the medical amnesty statute, which extends uh, immunities to uh, bystanders who administer uh, naloxone uh, when they believe someone is suffering from an overdose. So that's the kind of protection the legislature also gives licensed medical professionals when they're off duty and they stop by the roadside or whatever to, to provide medical assistance, give them that civil immunity, uh, just as a... Uh, <clears throat> as more incentive to inter intervene when you think your, your, your help might save a life. So um, that's what's been going on with medical amnesty. Um, I, I really don't 
think there's many more issues that the, the litigators, whether it's the public defenders or prosecutors, could massage out of this statute, uh, but you never know. Um, advocacy on both sides, um, always raising interesting issues. Uh, but the most recent case, 2021, is the one that made it a, a reasonable person standard on why, why in fact, 911 uh, was called. Um, so that's the that's the current state of the of the amnesty statute. Thank you for explaining that. Um, we appreciate it. I think I have a question for Kathy and Ben, and it's kind of just a big overarching question about. Who do you think should carry naloxone? Everyone. Um, I mean, I think really uh, with naloxone access being as readily available as ever before in my life, um, you know, certainly in Louisville Metro, we have, you know, five to 10 overdoses occurring every 24 hour period. So I think anybody who's able to access Narcan um, should get trained and carry it. With that being said, I think we should prioritize people who are most likely to be near someone who's going to experience an overdose. So that would be our residents who use drugs, our residents who have family members, friends, and neighbors who use drugs, um, and really anyone who is able and, and willing to tell their loved ones who use substances, I have Narcan and I will use it. Please, I'd rather know that you're using drugs and I can save your life than that you do this without me being aware and have the risk of losing. You, you talked about, um, you know, it's ideal for everyone to carry naloxone, but it, it's also really important for people who are using drugs, family and friends of those individuals and so forth. What about criminal legal professionals? Is it important for them to carry naloxone? Law enforcement, first responders, the whole gamut, correctional officers. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they are in that category of people who are disproportionately likely to come across someone who's experiencing overdose. Um, whether that's in a carceral setting, in the community. I mean, our EMS is reversing overdoses right now. Like within an hour of me saying this, it's likely that they'll have reversed an overdose. So if they weren't carrying Narcan, um, we would see a lot more deaths. Kathy, anything to add to this <laughs> from your perspective? I'm sorry, Sarah. So I, I do want to add that so if the criminal legal professionals are carrying it, it, it sets a good standard for destigmatizing Narcan, um, as well as dispelling myths and setting an educational standard. Um, our officers came to me when Ben first, we were able to bring the Narcan on site for distribution. And so they, they proactively asked for it for personal use outside of the facility. So I believe it's just a trickle down effect and it, I, th I think it's great. And I thank Ben every day <laughs> for his efforts <laughs> and persistence with us. So thank you. I mean, stigma is such a huge issue. I think you all hit the nail on the head and what, if you could share some insights on what agencies within the criminal legal system can do to help reduce stigma. <laughs> So I, I <laughs> hearing the last one. Every, I mean, everyone, I wish there were little keychains <laughs> for it. Um, so if the folks that are, you know, in the system and part of the system and promoting the system have this medication to save lives, all it does is is promote it within all all of the sectors of the criminal legal system, you know, there's three of them. So the more that, that become engaged, the more that that can set a standard of um, behavior and um, moral standards. I, I just think it's really important for all these different areas to, to have it and, it be, you know, just be consistent. 
I think one of the the barriers that folks who work in law enforcement face is that we have criminalized substances, and so it's it's difficult when they're wearing their law enforcement hat to to recognize that yes, okay, when when it comes to substance use, there is a criminal legal system context. There is a law that prohibits using these substances, possessing these substances, but that independently of what substances our society and our legal system has chosen to criminalize, that there's also the human side of it, the medical side of it, the social and psychological side of it. And that when it comes to understanding substance use disorder, we we have decades of hard quantitative evidence that criminalization does not address substance use disorder, that it, it is it is not an intervention that succeeds in saving lives. So being able to kind of distinguish between that conversation of is this substance legal or illegal and having that be its own conversation but not doing what I think is is often natural in our culture to say, well, if those people are engaging in an illegal behavior, then they are criminals. And if they're criminals, then they're bad guys. And if they're bad guys, then they don't deserve our compassion, our support, our response. I think for better or for worse, the fact that so many law enforcement officers have family members and friends who have experienced overdose and died of overdose means that there is a changing narrative of, of who in our society uses substances, who is at risk of experiencing an overdose. And I think that you know, I'm fortunate in that I can look at it solely from a public health perspective, but I think the more that our partners in the criminal legal system are able to at least have the public health lens as one of their lenses, for thinking about substance use, the healthier everyone will be. Kathy? So I just, I wanna add like our language <laughs> in the criminal legal system. I feel like we really need language matters and how we label a lot of this, the drug usage and addiction. I feel like that's really important to occur simultaneously with the education, with the distribution of Narcan, um, because there's certain words that inherently speak of crime rather than speak of disease. So I feel like we need to audit <laughs> the jails policies, the prosecutors' <laughs> language. It just I think if our the overall language changes, a, a lot of this will also change our behaviors and and laws. I think that's an excellent point, Kathy, and using person first language and talking about people who have an opioid use disorder helps emphasize that it's a medical, you know, a chronic medical condition. Um, and then there are medications to help address these chronic, mm -hmm. chronic medical conditions and that language does matter. I also think that, you know, carrying naloxone is an opportunity for a person to possibly have a change of course in their life if that's something they want to pursue. And so if someone overdoses and dies, that person has no opportunity for treatment. And so if a person overdoses and um, is administered naloxone, you know, they may have a change and want to go pursue a treatment option. And so that's another important opportunity for carrying naloxone. Um, so, why do you think people are hesitant to carry naloxone? Mm. I think Monica really covered some of it. We've had lots of sensationalized news stories similar to the sort of rise of the HIV epidemic where we have stories that are actively telling people this is a population who is unsafe, who you could die by interacting with, um, so I think it's a combination of that misinformation and, and also stigma. I mean, I've talked to people who, who really just genuinely don't want to be involved in any medical emergency that involves illegal substances because they've told, they've been told, oh, well, that person's going to punch you in the face for taking away their high. 
which is inaccurate. And again, just sort of perpetuating myths that lead to people dying. It may also be, Carrie, that years ago, there may have been a concern of an inference that if if law enforcement sees you carrying Narcan, that uh, there'd be an inference that you're engaged in criminal activity. But I think that is trending the other way now. In fact, I, I don't even think that uh, the presence of uh, Narcan in plain sight in a motor vehicle would even give rise to a reasonable suspicion to, to further an investigation or search, um, just because it's it's so prevalent. I mean, the FDA DA is considering it going OTC. So um, I, I think that is a, a trend that's that's positive. And uh, at our jail here in Kenton County, Narcan is, and I'm going to read from an email because I wanted to confirm the accuracy of this before this morning, but uh, Narcan is accessible to the deputies. Uh, it's, it's stored in a secure place in the facility. Uh, prisoners do not have Narcan or access to it uh, while incarcerated, but our uh, jail substance abuse program staff uh, does give training to all the inmates in the program. And uh, upon completion of that training, it is offered to them. Uh, it's stored in their personal property upon release from the facility. Um, and I believe all of that is uh, being administered through uh, uh, the Kenton County Detention Center through a uh, through a core grant, I believe, is what, what was reported to me. So it is... Um, it, it is readily available on the premises and inmates are leaving with it if properly trained on. I would um, add in terms uh, of why people don't carry naloxone, just from my experience training people out in the public and offering it to people out in the public, I hear a lot of people tell me, oh, I don't, I don't need that. That doesn't apply to me. Like, I don't know anybody that uses drugs. I don't know anybody that's at risk from fentanyl. And you know, you always have to have that conversation about like, you're not out in the world. You don't, you don't ever run into any, anybody else that you don't know. Um, wouldn't you want to save their life if you saw somebody experiencing an overdose? Um, so I think there is still, despite the, the growing death toll and the growing um, sort of interconnectedness of people, I think there is still this, this idea that naloxone is for specific populations and people are hesitant to carry it because they either don't want to be associated with those populations or they don't believe that they have contact with those populations. And I think if we had a magic wand and could really look at all of the connections, we would realize that everybody is not that far away from somebody who might be at risk. So I want to just pipe in with, I, th I feel like the media has a responsibility to just to educate a general population and show stories of successes and normalize naloxone and normalize language um, and also normalize <laughs> the language that how within the, the corrections, you know, they're incarcerated persons. Like the more we kind of perpetuate this language that sounds criminal and the media just shows stories of like negative impacts, then I, I think that will help tremendously. <clears throat> And that the media is using appropriate language as well. As right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I, also so I, would, I, I just want to, you know, I, I feel I'd be remiss if I missed saying this. I do want to really lift up our residents who we know are doing the most carrying of Narcan and the most reversals of overdoses. And that is our residents who use drugs, our participants, in our harm reduction services program, people who access clean syringes and safer injection supplies from our programs are the civilians who are saving the most lives in our community. And I think similarly to sort of the lack of media coverage of, of these life-saving heroes, you know, we, we have people every day in our community saving lives for free and just out of the, the goodness of their heart and their desire to not see their loved ones die. Um, we see that in the jail. I mean, the number of incarcerated people who have stepped up when given the opportunity to have access to Narcan and saved lives is inspiring to me. So I think, you know, for, for every person out there who's saying, I don't want Narcan because it's not my problem, I, I really just want to highlight all of the, the people who, again, are people who, who are usual media representation of is is not in a positive light, but all of the, the heroes out there 
who are saving lives and also happen to be incarcerated or use. Thank you, Ben. That's that's important framing and an important point. Um, one thing that Chris touched on about um, a model where jail was providing overdose education and distributing naloxone to everybody at discharge, that's one model. But another model is really innovative what is happening in the Louisville Metro Department of Corrections where they have the Nalox boxes or Narcan available inside the dorms. So I wanted to see if Ben and Kathy could talk a little bit about that model, how that evolved, how it's implemented, how you all do education. And what does education mean? Is it, how long does it take? And can you share a little bit about that? Sure, I mean, the most important education, to be honest, going into this was educating our leaders and decision makers on why this was critically important. And then this, this kind of relates to the previous question about reducing stigma and thinking about sort of the separate medical public health component and the criminal legal system component. When a person experiences a heart attack, we don't ask, well, how did they wind up even being in this situation? You know, what, what individual behavior choices did they make that led to their heart attack? We respond with an AED and CPR and medical care. Um, and I think when it comes to reversing overdoses, uh, in a lot of settings, the focus is on well, how did they get the substance? You know, why, why did they choose to use the substance, um, whether that's in the community or in the jail? And uh, again, what I think we've learned is, you know, even if we're able to prevent 99% of the drugs from getting into that jail, drugs still do get in. There's demand. Pe people are living in conditions that makes them, for many reasons, uh, want to use substances. And overdoses are going to occur. So really explaining the impossibility of misusing Narcan and highlighting that the current policy of having the Narcan outside of the dorm may have contributed to some of the deaths that we saw of incarcerated people. Um, and that rather than jumping to finger pointing and blame, really, you know, we have an evidence-based intervention that saves lives when people experience an overdose. And, uh, you know, to, to my previous point about our heroes in the community, my team and I went dorm to dorm in, you know, all 51 congregate dorms at LMDC. And over and over again, the thing we heard as we were training, ostensibly training people on Narcan administration, was, you know, people raising their hand and saying, yeah, I've reversed 20 overdoses in my life. You know, I've, I've saved 15 people. Um, you know, this is, thank you for coming. Thank you for providing it. You know, keep keep on giving the presentation, but we are experts on this. We, we know how to save lives. <laughs> yeah. All we need is access to this, this tool. And I think, you know, from that perspective, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll go in and provide that training anytime. But the fact of the matter is, our criminal legal system already uh, disproportionately arrests and incarcerates people who have the expertise to reverse overdoses. We have people in every dorm who are experienced lifesavers. And so really the, the biggest thing was getting them access to that tool and then providing some basic training for everyone in the dorm who, who wasn't familiar. Yeah, so I want to pipe in real quick with what something Ben said. So when we started, uh, I guess, what, two years ago, with distributing um, Narcan to folks that were on detox protocols when they leave the facility, we, we had a video. And the general consensus was, well, we already know this. <laughs> why, are you, why are you telling us something? Why are you giving us something we already know? And so I think to Ben's point, it's what bringing the Narcan in the dorms was was what was really impactful and what was genuinely wanted and needed. And I really do, I mean, I wanna lift up LMDC leadership on this one. You know, they had a lot of questions about potential for misuse. Their, you know, their priority is the safety of incarcerated people. And, you know, that included, well, could somebody spray this in someone's nose who didn't need it and cause them harm? 
or you know what if they flush it down the toilet or you know any one of a number of things with ill intent um and we, we kind of talked through all of those and they determined that any risk of someone you know stealing the narcan or clogging the toilets with it um, was outweighed by the risk of someone dying by not having access to the Narcan. And not a single case of an incarcerated person misusing that Narcan has come up in every single case. You know, originally they were going to put it in a alarm box that when you open it, it sets off a, a ear shattering siren so that everybody is aware of it. But we were moving so fast that we just wanted to get it in the dorm. So in many dorms, it's just stuck on the window with some double-sided tape and it's just there unprotected and not a single person, you know, people who the, the jail was concerned might have, you know, intent to, to just for whatever reason, uh, interfere with it. If people respect it and they've taken care of it and, and accepted that program as, as their own. Would you mind to share a little bit, you talked about, um about working with jail leadership on understanding overdose education and the importance of having naloxone accessible. What about the individuals who are frontline correctional um, staff? I know that it was pointed out in the chat, like officers may be perceived as not willing to administer naloxone, but a lot of them are dedicated and will administer naloxone. What have you all found in your experience? Kathy, so, do you want to talk a little yeah, bit about Yeah, I, I can start out. Um, so I think the frequency of overdoses has been traumatizing to our officers. And having it placed in the dorms has been a bit of a relief. And they also, as soon as they heard the words, when people leave, they, the chance is 40 times greater of death with you know without the narcan or drug usage that that and then they got it real quick and so that was extremely helpful and the we have our property folks that are great about distributing it and putting it in people's property every day um it was just something new but it didn't seem to take a whole lot of time to kind of get it if that makes sense and then the masking for it for themselves it's just sort of grown. Yeah. And in a related fashion, Chris, what, you know, from your perspective um, in the county attorney's office, what are their opportunities for county attorneys to collaborate with their law enforcement and corrections colleagues to address the opioid crisis? Like how can they, from a legal, legal perspective, answer some of their questions? Well, I think I, what I said earlier is certainly uh, something that I asked our chief prosecutor uh, this week and, you know, preparation for today. I said, what do you think about officers who see uh, Narcan in plain view at a traffic stop? Would that give, uh, would that give any articulable suspicion to further an investigation for suspected drug activity? And um, he said that he, he would not uh, for that on the, on that basis alone. Uh, advise an officer that it was okay to extend a stop based solely on that. Um, as far as is in the jail, um, you know, our deputies are very, uh, very accustomed to using Narcan, um, uh, providing it um, if an inmate is is in a booking area and, and seems to be experiencing a, an overdose from something that had happened prior to intake. So, you know, often I'm not, uh, I represent the jail on, on civil liability issues. A lot of them have to do with um, medical standards of care once they're in our custody. And certainly that is a pivotal point um, from a legal liability standpoint is once a prisoner uh, transfers custody from the arresting agency to the detention facility, um, that is the county's responsibility. Uh, for the care, custody, and control of that inmate. And uh, the care component um, is significant because once they're confined, they're dependent upon jail staff and our medical contractor uh, to get everything they need 
um, to exist uh, as health as healthy as they can be in the jail. Um, so once that special relationship exists, a custody relationship, um, then the law is pretty clear. There is a duty. Uh, there's an affirmative duty to take life-saving measures, and that also would include Narcan uh, in the in the jail setting. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. That that's kind of the the scope that I that I deal with most frequently um, in my capacity here. That, uh, building on that, there there was a question if um, a person is a professional emergency or other response staff person, say like they're police, fire, um, treatment center staff, and they have Narcan on them. And as part of their professional responsibility, they come across somebody um, who they think is experiencing an overdose and they choose not to administer Narcan, are yes. they legally responsible? Yeah, this, this may be shocking, uh, but under both federal law and Kentucky law, uh, absent a special relationship, custody being the one that would be uh, most obvious here, or, or a state created danger that the government actually increased their risk, um, there, there is no affirmative duty for to, in this instance, to administer Narcan. There has to be a special relationship recognized under the law for that affirmative duty to, to exist, to create legal liability. Um, so in the situation of uh, the arresting agency or the detention facility, yes, once they're in custody, there's an affirmative duty to act. If they're not in custody and the state did not do something to uh, increase their risk, um, of a bad outcome, uh, then there is no affirmative duty to act. And outside of the government context, private citizens, they have no duty to act. Um, but I think, you know, I think if you polled nine out of 10 people, if they're carrying Narcan and come across somebody who they uh, s suspect is administering an overdose, they're gonna do their best to, to, save, to save the life. But that, that moral compass is not, uh, completely congruent with where the law establishes a duty. Does that apply to teacher and student? That was a question in the chat. Um, I, I would think that due to the local parentis concept of teacher student that a special relationship would exist uh, in that context. Okay. Um, Jody Jaggers put in the chat that the Office of Drug Control Policy has a federal grant that will provide naloxone, um, I believe, to any law enforcement agencies. If Jody wants to put that chat in the link, or that link in the chat, that would be great. Um, I know that Van Ingram's office has done a lot of wonderful work on this, and they are advertising that opportunity. And the Healing Community Study has worked with Van Ingram to do a Repub brief public service announcement that will be um, helping to push out to get more law enforcement um, to be able to have naloxone uh, to carry. So I have another question um, for whoever wants to, to at answer it. And that is what advice do you have for those who obtain naloxone but might have it taken away from them by the police? Any takers on that? <laughs> but, I mean, why would why was it seized? I guess would be my question right away. Yeah. Well, why was it seized to begin with? Um, and property that is seized um, by any governmental agency that is required to be held for a period of time for retrieval. But um, you know, I I would I would think with uh, the availability of of naloxone that. Um, mm -hmm. I would think Chris, it would be pretty ready, readily available to anybody that wants to carry it. Uh, Chris, this is Scott Hardcorn. Can you hear me? Hey, Scott. I sure can. How's it going? Good. Uh, I just want to, I can only speak for my agency. So I'm with the Northern Kentucky Drug Strike Force, and we do search warrants every day and come in contact with probably more drug users and dealers than any other agency around. And I, I've never seen a law enforcement officer ever take naloxone from somebody i'm not saying it doesn't happen it probably does i mean there's silly stuff that happens all the time but uh i was previously with kenton county police department and we were one of the first agencies in the state to start carrying naloxone um and we promote it i mean it 
I've never seen that happen, but I'm not saying it doesn't, if that helps. If you all don't think that happens, we'll move on to the final question. Yeah, I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying I've never seen it. I mean, it, almost every search warrant we do or a person we encounter, if we search their vehicle, they've got, we just expect to see it everywhere we go now. It's, it's so prevalent that uh, we did a search warrant yesterday and there was naloxone in, in just about every room that we went in. That, that's all the context I had that, you know, as part of the search that it might be taken in with all of their items. Um, so I think my last question, this is my favorite question, and I would like each of the panelists to answer this. But if you could wave a magic wand, what would you change or what needs improvement um, in the criminal legal system to help reduce opioid overdose deaths. What are you gonna do with your magic wand? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll take a stab. All right. Public health <laughs> side. I mean, I think, as I said before, um, you know, from a scientific perspective, from a, a literature and research perspective, we have seen that law enforcement is not an effective primary intervention for chaotic substance use, risky substance use, substance use disorder, recreational substance use. In none of these cases uh, is it likely to reduce harm. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now is, is a huge amount of harm that's compounded by the mandate given to the criminal legal system to address what ultimately is a biological, psychological, social, phenomenon. Um, so I think if I had a magic wand, I really would just remove that requirement from criminal legal systems to address a biological, psychological, and social phenomenon. I think you know, it, it's not a supply side problem. We've seen an incredible uh, effort by law enforcement and a successful uh, enforcement effort to reduce access to prescription painkillers that led to a, a dramatic decline in the number of Kentuckians using prescription painkillers and a simultaneous precipitous increase in Kentuckians using heroin. And that heroin had a higher death rate and a higher overdose fatality rate than the prescription painkillers that we saw. And, you know, we saw a successful stamping out of black tar heroin in the state such that virtually nobody in my county, uh, even if they're seeking it, can find heroin. Um, but what they're finding is, is fentanyl. And now I see our Commonwealth uh, working up to, to view fentanyl as public enemy number one and uh, increase enforcement in an attempt to uh, completely stamp out the supply. And it's hard for me to imagine that without addressing that demand issue, without addressing the, the medical needs and the social determinants of health of the people who are using those substances, um, it's hard for me to imagine that we're not gonna see a replacement of a more dangerous molecule that we are less prepared to respond to as we've seen you know, sort of in, in three subsequent waves. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we would see a decrease in the number of overdoses in custody if we saw fewer arrests for people for substance possession. Um, we'd see a greater linkage to services uh, if we didn't have to have everybody who uses substances feel that they have to do that in secret to not put themselves at risk of criminal legal. Uh, Thank you, Ben. And I want everybody to use their magic wands and write in the chat as well, if you have an idea. So we can all share ideas why the rest of the panelists are answering this question. And we only have five minutes left, so. So I will go quickly because this has already come up in the chat. I I imagined my magic wand to be a little less powerful than Ben's. If, if his works, I want him to do his, but <laughs> um, if not, I want my magic wand to provide MOUD, medications for opioid use disorder in more places in the criminal legal system, um, right? It shouldn't be an alternative pathway. It should be available to the people that are in jail. It should be available to the people that are um, 
encountering law enforcement uh, wherever they are. If they are willing to take medications, they should be connected to medications to treat their, their substance use disorder. My magic wand, um, uh, enhanced border control. I think that's gonna curb a lot of the problems. Um, and locally, now that I know my audience, I'll save more funding for uh, Director Hardcorn and the North Kentucky Drug Strike Force. How's that? <laughs> so mine will be quick. <laughs> and decriminalization, cash bail, and diverted from the criminal legal system. Like, just avoid it all together. Well, thank you all. I appreciate all of your ideas. And thank you for all of the great work that our audience members are doing. I know we have um, a lot of people who are working in the criminal legal system on the call today, and um, we appreciate all the good work that you do. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to do the final thank you for our panelists and talk about the continuing ed credits. Thank you, Carrie. Boy, this was a wonderful session and thank you to all our presenters today. Um, it was really educational. I learned so much from all of you. So thank you. Um, just briefly, I'm just going to go over. Whoops. I thought I had the whoops. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, I want to go over how to get the CE credits for today's session. And um, also links shared in the chat box. So I am going to share that um, with everybody session email. And um, also, right before the session started, Ben offered his email. So if anyone has specific questions for Ben, he would be willing to share, you know, what his experiences are and help in any way he can. So that was really uh, wonderful that uh, Ben was able to do that. And I think Rose is going to share that in the chat box. But if you um, are wanting CE credit, um, go ahead and um, just click on to the link that uh, Rose is sharing in the uh, chat box. There is a QR code here, but I think it's just easier to uh, get the link and um, fill out the information and you'll be able to get that. The credit or the activity code for today's session is up here and again in the chat box. And it's very simple. Now, if this is the first time you're using um, the CE Central, you do have to register, but it's very quick. It's uh, less than a minute process of putting your name and email and things like that in there. And then you'll be able to get your CE credit. We also do certificate of attendance. So you'll be able to do that with the previous link that I shared in the, in the previous slide. Oops. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is the feedback survey. We do want your input about this session and what would you like to see in future sessions? So this will take less than a minute to complete if you wouldn't mind. And I know Rose is sharing this link in the chat box to fill this out and, and give us that valuable feedback. We really do review these surveys and we get a lot of information um, from them. So I appreciate your time in doing that. And then just to let you know, our next session is going to be about a first responder leave behind. It is March 22nd. Those invites for that session is gonna go out this week. So we're really excited to have that presentation. And then we are working on um, transformational employment, uh, the media and addiction reporting. And then we also are going to, we just had a late uh, discussion this week about um, the opioid um, abatement funds and having a session on that too. 